Chapter fourteen part two of the Voyage Out by Virginia Wolf. The Sleebervox recording is in the public domain. But Hurst did not help him, and the other people, with their aimless movements and their unknown lives, were disturbing, so that he longed for the empty darkness. The first thing he looked for when he stepped out of the hall door was the light of the Ambrose's villa. When he had definitely decided that a certain light apart from the others higher up the hill was their light, he was considerably reassured. There seemed to be at once a little stability in all this incoherence. Without any definite plan in his head, he took the turning to the right and walked through the town and came to the wall by the meeting of the roads where he stopped. The booming of the sea was audible. The dark blue mass of the mountains rose against the paler blue of the sky. There was no moon, but myriads of stars, and lights were anchored up and down in the dark waves of earth all round him. He had meant to go back, but the single light of the Ambrose's villa had now become three separate lights, and he was tempted to go on. He might as well make sure that Rachel was still there. Walking fast, he soon stood by the iron gate of their garden, and pushed it open. The outline of the house suddenly appeared sharply before his eyes, and the thin column of the veranda cutting across the palely lit gravel of the terrace. He hesitated. At the back of the house someone was rattling cans. He approached the front. The light on the terrace showed him that the sitting-rooms were on that side. He stood as near the light as he could by the corner of the house, the leaves of a creeper brushing his face. After a moment he could hear a voice. The voice went on steadily. It was not talking but from the continuity of the sound it was a voice reading aloud. He crept a little closer. He crumpled the leaves together so as to stop their rustling about his ears. It might be Rachel's voice. He left the shadow and stepped into the radius of the light, and then heard a sentence spoken quite distinctly. And there we lived from the year 1860, to 1895, the happiest years of my parents' lives. And there, in 1862, my brother Morris was born, to the delight of his parents, as he was destined to be the delight of all who knew him. The voice quickened, and the tone became conclusive, rising slightly in pitch, as if these words were at the end of the chapter. Hewitt drew back again into the shadow. There was a long silence. He could just hear chairs being moved inside. He had almost decided to go back when suddenly two figures appeared at the window, not six feet from him. It was Morris Fielding, of course, that your mother was engaged to, said Helen's voice. She spoke reflectively, looking out into the dark garden, and thinking evidently as much of the look of the night as of what she was saying. Mother, said Rachel. Hewitt's heart leapt, and he noticed the fact. Her voice, though low, was full of surprise. You didn't know that, said Helen. I never knew there'd been anyone else, said Rachel. She was clearly surprised, but all they said was said low and inexpressively, because they were speaking out into the cool dark night. More people were in love with her than with anyone I've ever known, Helen stated. She had that power. She enjoyed things. She wasn't beautiful, but I was thinking of her last night at the dance. She got on with every kind of person and then she made it all so amazingly funny. 
It appeared that Helen was going back into the past, choosing her words deliberately, comparing Theresa with the people she had known since Theresa died. I don't know how she did it, she continued, and ceased. And there was a long pause, in which a little owl called first here, then there, as it moved from tree to tree in the garden. That's so like Aunt Lucy and Aunt Katie, said Rachel at last. They always make out that she was very sad and very good. Then why, for goodness sake, did they do nothing but criticize her when she was alive, said Helen. Very gentle their voices sounded, as if they fell through the waves of the sea. If I were to die tomorrow, she began. The broken sentences had an extraordinary beauty and detachment in Hewitt's ears, and a kind of mystery, too, as though they were spoken by people in their sleep. No, Rachel, Helen's voice continued, I'm not going to walk in the garden. It's damp. It's sure to be damp. Besides, I see at least a dozen toads. Toads? Those are stones, Helen. Come out. It's nicer out. The flowers smell, Rachel replied. Hewitt drew still farther back. His heart was beating very quickly. Apparently Rachel tried to pull Helen out on to the terrace, and Helen resisted. There was a certain amount of scuffling, entreating, resisting, and laughter from both of them. Then a man's form appeared. Hewitt could not hear what they were all saying. In a minute they had gone in. He could hear bolts grating. Then there was dead silence, and all the lights went out. He turned away still crumpling and uncrumpling a handful of leaves which he had torn from the wall. An exquisite sense of pleasure and relief possessed him. It was all so solid and peaceful after the ball at the hotel, whether he was in love with them or not. And he was not in love with them, no, but it was good that they should be alive. After standing still for a minute or two, he turned and began to walk towards the gate. With the movement of his body, the excitement, the romance and the richness of life crowded into his brain, he shouted out a line of poetry, but the words escaped him, and he stumbled among lines and fragments of lines, which had no meaning at all except for the beauty of the words. He shut the gate and ran swinging from side to side down the hill, shouting any nonsense that came into his head. Here am I, he cried rhythmically, as his feet pounded to the left and to the right, plunging along like an elephant in the jungle, stripping the branches as I go. He snatched at the twigs of a bush at the roadside roaring innumerable words, lovely words about innumerable things, running downhill and talking nonsense aloud to myself about roads and leaves and lights and women coming out into the darkness, about women, about Rachel, about Rachel. He stopped and drew a deep breath. The night seemed immense and hospitable and although so dark, there seemed to be things moving down there in the harbour, and movement out at sea. He gazed until the darkness numbed him, and then he walked on quickly, still murmuring to himself. And I ought to be in bed, snoring and dreaming, 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 dreams and realities, dreams and realities dreams and realities he repeated all the way up the avenue scarcely knowing what he said until he reached the front door here he paused for a second and collected himself 
before he opened the door. His eyes were dazed, his hands very cold, and his brain excited and yet half asleep. Inside the door everything was as he had left it, except that the hall was now empty. There were the chairs turning in towards each other, where people had sat talking, and the empty glasses on little tables, and the newspapers scattered on the floor. As he shut the door he felt as if he were enclosed in a square box, and instantly shriveled up. It was all very bright and very small. He stopped for a minute by the long table to find a paper which he had meant to read, but he was still too much under the influence of the dark and the fresh air to consider carefully which paper it was, or where he had seen it. As he fumbled vaguely among the papers, he saw a figure cross the tail of his eye, coming downstairs. He heard the swishing sound of skirts, and to his great surprise, Evelyn M. came up to him, laid her hand on the table as if to prevent him from taking up a paper, and said, You're just the person I wanted to talk to. Her voice was a little unpleasant and metallic. Her eyes were very bright, and she kept them fixed upon him. To talk to me, he repeated, but I'm half asleep. But I think you understand better than most people, she answered, and sat down on a little chair placed beside a big leather chair, so that Hewitt had to sit down beside her. Well, he said. He yawned openly and lit a cigarette. He could not believe that this was really happening to him. What is it? Are you really sympathetic, or is it just a pose? she demanded. It's for you to say, he replied. I'm interested, I think. He still felt numb all over and as if she was much too close to him. "'Anyone can be interested,' she cried impatiently. "'Your friend Mr. Hurst's interested. I dare say, however, I do believe in you. You look as if you'd got a nice sister somehow.' She paused, picking at some sequins on her knees, and then, as if she had made up her mind, she started off. Anyhow, I'm going to ask your advice. Do you ever get into a state where you don't know your own mind? That's the state I'm in now. You see, last night at the dance, Raymond Oliver, he's the tall dark boy who looks as if he had Indian blood in him, but he says he's not really. Well, we were sitting out together, and he told me all about himself how unhappy he is at home, and how he hates being out here. They put him into some beastly mining business. He says it's beastly. I should like it, I know, but that's neither here nor there. And I felt awfully sorry for him. One couldn't help being sorry for him. And when he asked me to let him kiss me, I did. I don't see any harm in that, do you? And then this morning he said he'd thought I meant something more, and I wasn't the sort to let anyone kiss me. And we talked and talked. I dare say I was very silly, but one can't help liking people when one's sorry for them. I do like him most awfully. She paused. So I gave him half a promise, and then, you see, there's Alfred Perrot. Oh, Perrot, said Hewitt. We got to know each other on that picnic the other day, she continued. He seemed so lonely, especially as Arthur had gone off with Susan, and one couldn't help guessing what was in his mind. So we had quite a long talk when you were looking at the ruins and he told me all about his life, and his struggles, and how fearfully hard it had been, 
Do you know he was a boy in a grocer's shop, and took parcels to people's houses in a basket? That interested me awfully, because I always say it doesn't matter how you're born, if you've got the right stuff in you. And he told me about his sister, who's paralyzed, poor girl and one can see she's a great trial, though he's evidently very devoted to her. I must say I do admire people like that. I don't expect you do, because you're so clever. Well, last night we sat out in the garden together, and I couldn't help seeing what he wanted to say, and comforting him a little, and telling him I did care. I really do. Only, then there's Raymond Oliver. What I want you to tell me is, can one be in love with two people at once, or can't one? She became silent and sat with her chin on her hands, looking very intent, as if she were facing a real problem which had to be discussed between them. I think it depends what sort of person you are, said Hewitt. He looked at her. She was small and pretty, aged perhaps twenty-eight or twenty-nine, but though dashing and sharply cut, her features expressed nothing very clearly, except a great deal of spirit and good health. "'Who are you? What are you? You see, I know nothing about you,' he continued. "'Well, I was coming to that,' said Evelyn M., she continued to rest her chin on her hands and to look intently ahead of her. I'm the daughter of a mother and no father, if that interests you, she said. It's not a very nice thing to be. It's what often happens in the country. She was a farmer's daughter, and he was rather a swell, the young man up at the great house. He never made things straight never married her, though he allowed us quite a lot of money. His people wouldn't let him. Poor father. I can't help liking him. Mother wasn't the sort of woman who could keep him straight anyhow. He was killed in the war. I believe his men worshipped him. They say great big troopers broke down and cried over his body on the battlefield. I wish I'd known him. Mother had all the life crushed out of her. The world. She clenched her fist. Oh, people can be horrid to a woman like that. She turned upon Hewitt. Well, she said, do you want to know any more about me? But you, he asked, who looked after you? I've looked after myself mostly, she laughed. I've had splendid friends. I do like people. That's the trouble. What would you do if you liked two people, both of them tremendously, and you couldn't tell which most? I should go on liking them. I should wait and see. Why not? But one has to make up one's mind, said Evelyn. Or are you one of the people who doesn't believe in marriages and all that? Look here, this isn't fair. I do all the telling, and you tell nothing. Perhaps you're the same as your friend. She looked at him suspiciously. Perhaps you don't like me. I don't know you, said Hewitt. I know when I like a person directly I see them. I knew I liked you the very first night at dinner. Oh, dear, she continued impatiently. What a lot of bother would be saved if only people would say the things they think straight out. I'm made like that. I can't help it. But don't you find it leads to difficulties? Hewitt asked. That's men's fault, she answered. They always drag it in love, I mean. And so you've gone on having one proposal after another, said Hewitt. 
I don't suppose I've had more proposals than most women, said Evelyn, but she spoke without conviction. Five, six, ten, Hewitt ventured. Evelyn seemed to intimate that perhaps ten was the right figure, but that it really was not a high one. I believe you're thinking me a heartless flirt, she protested. But I don't care if you are. I don't care what anyone thinks of me. Just because one's interested and likes to be friends with men, and talk to them as one talks to women, one's called a flirt. But Miss Murgatroyd— I wish you'd call me Evelyn, she interrupted. After ten proposals, do you honestly think that men are the same as women? Honestly, honestly, how I hate that word. It's always used by prigs, cried Evelyn. Honestly, I think they ought to be. That's what's so disappointing. Every time one thinks it's not going to happen, and every time it does, the Pursuit of Friendship, said Hewitt, the title of a comedy. You're horrid, she cried. You don't care a bit, really. You might be Mr. Hurst. Well, said Hewitt, let's consider. Let us consider. He paused, because for the moment he could not remember what it was that they had to consider. He was far more interested in her than in her story, for as she went on speaking his numbness had disappeared, and he was conscious of a mixture of liking, pity, and distrust. "'You've promised to marry both Oliver and Perrot, he concluded. "'Not exactly promised,' said Evelyn. "'I can't make up my mind which I really like best.' Oh, how I detest modern life, she flung off. It must have been so much easier for the Elizabethans. I thought the other day on that mountain how I'd have liked to be one of those colonists. To cut down trees and make laws and all that, instead of fooling about with all these people who think one's just a pretty young lady. Though I'm not. I really might do something. She reflected in silence for a minute, then she said, I'm afraid right down in my heart that Alfred Perrot won't do. He's not strong, is he? Perhaps he couldn't cut down a tree, said Hewitt. Have you never cared for anybody? he asked. I've cared for heaps of people, but not to marry them, she said. I suppose I'm too fastidious. All my life I've wanted somebody I could look up to, somebody great and big and splendid. Most men are so small. What do you mean by splendid? Hewitt asked. People are, nothing more. Evelyn was puzzled. We don't care for people because of their qualities, he tried to explain. It's just them that we care for. He struck a match. Just that, he said, pointing to the flames. I see what you mean, she said, but I don't agree. I do know why I care for people, and I think I'm hardly ever wrong. I see at once what they've got in them. Now I think you must be rather splendid, but not Mr. Hurst. Hewitt shook his head. He's not nearly so unselfish, or so sympathetic, or so big, or so understanding, Evelyn continued. Hewitt sat silent, smoking his cigarette. I should hate cutting down trees, he remarked. I'm not trying to flirt with you, though I suppose you think I am, Evelyn shot out. 
I'd never have come to you if I'd thought you'd merely think odious things of me. The tears came into her eyes. Do you never flirt? he asked. Of course I don't, she protested. Haven't I told you? I want friendship. I want to care for someone greater and nobler than I am. And if they fall in love with me, it isn't my fault. I don't want it. I positively hate it. Hewitt could see that there was very little use in going on with the conversation, for it was obvious that Evelyn did not wish to say anything in particular, but to impress upon him an image of herself, being for some reason which she would not reveal, unhappy or insecure. He was very tired, and a pale waiter kept walking ostentatiously into the middle of the room and looking at them meaningly. They want to shut up, he said. My advice is that you should tell Oliver and Perrot tomorrow that you've made up your mind that you don't mean to marry either of them. I'm certain you don't. If you change your mind you can always tell them so. They're both sensible men. They'll understand. And then all this bother will be over. He got up. But Evelyn did not move. She sat looking up at him with her bright, eager eyes, in the depths of which he thought he detected some disappointment or dissatisfaction. Good night, he said. There are heaps of things I want to say to you still, she said, and I'm going to some time. I suppose you must go to bed now. Yes, said Hewitt, I'm half asleep. He left her still sitting by herself in the empty hall. Why is it that they won't be honest, he muttered to himself as he went upstairs. Why was it that relations between different people were so unsatisfactory, so fragmentary, so hazardous? and words so dangerous that the instinct to sympathize with another human being was an instinct to be examined carefully and probably crushed. What had Evelyn really wished to say to him? What was she feeling, left alone in the empty hall? The mystery of life and the unreality even of one's own sensations overcame him as he walked down the corridor which led to his room. It was dimly lighted, but sufficiently for him to see a figure in a bright dressing gown pass swiftly in front of him, the figure of a woman crossing from one room to another. End of chapter 14